Hey everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind, the mixtape. We're now in year 1989, and John's with me to discuss our top 10 albums of that year. How's it going, John? I'm doing okay. Yeah. How do you do? Relatively, I'm melting. <laughs> you could sop me up with a biscuit. I'm gonna definitely taking a shower after this recording because it's already roasting. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, for me. Yeah, well, 10.30 here, but... Uh... Yeah, it's still pretty warm outside. All right, so what we do is uh, we go back and forth with our top ten albums, not necessarily liking each other's. That's kind of the game we play, and uh, you'll notice if I don't say much or he doesn't say much. <laughs> All right, so I guess we flip the coin digitally, virtually. Uh, I am going first. So my first album is XTC, XTC Oranges and Lemons. Okay, yeah, this is one where I kind of warned you I might have to lean heavily on you. Uh, I I did listen to the whole thing, so before anyone, you know, like my lack of things, I did listen to the whole thing. Uh, Across the Ant Heap was really like the only song I liked, but it's like I, I, they were going for that that faux 60s sound, uh-huh. and it, it just wasn't doing it for me. It's not as strong as some of their other work. I struggled again to get to 10. I have a list here of what didn't make it, but um, I just think the first... This is weird. This is like their most uh, successful American breakthrough. Of course, college radio is different than like you know top 40 billboard because um, I think the previous album is much bigger in college radio. But uh, this one uh, is just... I think maybe the problem is they went too expansive. There's so many songs and they're so long. I can't believe it's a four-side vinyl. It's so strange to think of that when it only has like twelve songs. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Uh, it like I said, it's there's I I enjoy the music of the '60s. There's stuff like uh, in a lot of the different revivals that that you kind of get. Kind of how over the years, uh, like everything that's about twenty years old starts to kind of get popular again. Yeah. Uh, you kind of get that up, uptick of things, and I can see where the '60s feeling—you know—people would want to get into that that feeling again, especially considering that it's '89, so it's like the fall, of, you know, uh, the end of uh, the USSR and things like that. Well, we're in the whole Vietnam, you know, looking back era, and I remember this year is when everybody started wearing tie dye. And getting into the doors and stuff like that. And I think this is the only album. They always had a pop sensibility, but this is the only one I think that feels retro. And I do think that's a a detriment to it because the previous albums were like of the now. They were modern rock. Yeah, and I think there's some bands who can do retro stuff uh, while I, you know, totally off, not off topic, but uh Muse did their like eighties esque album a couple of years back and I think that was a strong effort. Yeah. Rooney is the... known for going through certain uh decades with their music, trying to replicate that sound. Yeah. Well it's like especially because Muse tried doing dubstep in one of their albums and it's fucking unlistenable. Oh, really? I haven't heard that one. I haven't listened to anything in quite a while from them. Oh god, it's like the second step or something like that. Okay. And <laughs> has a very dubstep y sound to it and it's it's so bad it it genuinely made me want to hate the band completely but then but then they did an 80s esque album and i was happy do you again. feel like of of the nine years that we've done no no we've done 10 now i forgot because we got uh, in 1980 counts um do you think this was the hardest to get through i almost thought about telling you just part back to five no i actually i had a lot of stuff there where i genuinely sat down and went okay i am not going to do x x x you know certain albums because i did not want to deprive you of choices oh okay yeah i was yeah it was rough for me this year but um what's your first one then we're gonna go into what almost made it okay my very first one how about i do skinny puppies rabies um, that for me started off a little rough, but a real a, a few of your albums I feel like started off rough, and I thought about bailing. But if you hold on to like the third or fourth single, then everything lines up. Well, and that's the thing is, it Skinny Puppy is one of these founding bands of industrial rock, 
and they influence so many people. But it's like, uh, you know, hell, Trent Reznor pretty much ripped off their uh, 86 song Dig It for uh, Down In It. Yeah, I thought there was something familiar about that. Yeah, so it's basically, this is a band that's very harsh, very uh, aggressive. It is not necessarily uh, very accessible music, but this album, Rabies, and this was, I was, I was trying to decide on doing a Skinny Puppy album at some point because they're really great albums, but I knew that if I can't do like mind the perpetual intercourse or something like that i would have to do rabies because rabies again is if you're going to talk about accessible in them this is probably it <laughs> there was a, a kid i hung out with we actually had a radio show together for a couple years uh his name is aaron and he listened to a lot of this stuff i really could not get into it and he really was like he, he wouldn't push on me but he would try it out every once in a while and see what i thought and I like this. I, the whole industrial thing, of course, is the fact it sounds like a factory, but mixed in with lots of samples. It was like their version of hip hop. '89 is when all of a sudden, like, layered samples were all over the place in music, and industrial was way ahead of hip hop. Yeah, this very much. Uh, well, it's partially because the idea is to uh, basically kind of yeah create these soundscapes, and uh, Skinny Puppy, for their part, is essentially like. A horror film put to music. Yeah, uh, I think of the movie Hardware. As, <laughs> yeah, it's it is you know because they're a very political band, so a lot of their stuff is like about animal rights and uh, you know the horrors of war and you know all these political stuff and like I mean one thing to you know to make mention about them was allegedly their music was used to torture prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Which pissed the band off. And they <laughs> actually went and sued the U.S. government for uh, using their music without without their permission. Oh yeah, right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, yeah, it these are this is a band that their tours at the time were like horror film sets and stuff. They spent a lot of time creating a visual aesthetic that matched this uh, thing. And you know, I mean, this this album has Tin Omen. And uh, Warlock, which are pretty much the the only radio hits that this band really ever had up until God, what two thousand and four, I think, something like that. Whenever their their comeback record came out, but yeah, this but this is like uh, one of the reasons why is Ministry. Uh, Al Jurgens from Ministry worked on this album with them, as long along with uh, Dave Rave Ogilvy who Dave Rave Ogilvy has worked with Carly Rae Jepsen. Dave <laughs> Rae, I did not expect men, that. Men Without Hats, Tool, Motley Crue. I mean, <laughs> amongst amongst all sorts of like industrial groups too. It's like, yeah, there, there's kind of a reason why this isn't as punching you in the face hard. Even though it's very harsh, very dystopian, very, you know, very punch you in the face hard. Yeah. So I fought off a sneeze like five minutes ago and I keep sniffing, so I apologize. I'm not doing lines of coke. All right. Well, what is your next one? All right. So, um, well, first off, let's discuss the... No, hold on a second. I was going to say, let's discuss the ones that didn't make the list, but then we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to surprise the audience. So never mind. We'll wait. We'll get to the very end. Um, all right, so my second one is Elvis Costello Spike, which actually was my first one, but I read this list out of order, so I apologize. And this is the album. I think this is the first album. I maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is the first album I actually gave up on. Yeah, it's look like I said I struggled to get to ten. I liked it a little bit better than I obviously like I finished it. But um, I just remember this one being kind of significant because he had disappeared for a few years. Like, he made albums, but they weren't really pushed by the label. And I just remember, like, seeing this cover everywhere for a while, and it got good reviews. It got his first top 10 in a long, or uh, whatever, top 40 song in quite some time. And uh, I, do you enjoy Elvis Costello, or is he not really your kind of thing? He's, he's not my thing, and that's kind okay. of things like, I... Gave it. A, I gave it the Gold College try. I got eight songs into this. Oh, okay. That's better. But, it's farther than I got than one of your albums. <laughs> but I got bored. I was just 
Okay, let's skip. Oh, this is why it was a big deal, because he hadn't played with the attraction since 1977. And so it was a 12-year gap between him and, and playing with them on that and Spike. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could. I wish this was something I could have enjoyed. I, I, I'm always open for new and interesting stuff, but... Yeah, we're good. That, no need to yeah. go into it. I didn't have much to say either, so uh, your turn. All right. Well, I spoke of Nine Inch Nails, so how about... Pretty Hate Machine by Nine Inch Nails. Fucking love this album. I don't even like industrial music, but I fucking love this album. I like all the Nine Inch Nails albums. Um, and I, the minute I popped this in, I was like, oh yeah, I remember all these because I have an uncle who's just a few months older than me, and he had this album, and I was like, I had heard Head Like a Hole in a movie called Prayer of the Roller Boys. Boy, that's a deep cut for all you fucking nerds. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember, like, that song was pretty cool. And someone I knew had seen the movie recently. I was like, oh, yeah, that's Nine Inch Nails. I was like, who is Nine Inch Nails? That's a hell of a name. And then um, I saw that album at my uncle's house. I listened to it. And, yeah, I, it's still, from day one, he knew exactly what he wanted it to sound like. He somehow makes industrial pop friendly. I mean, I mean if you know what I mean. Well, that's the thing. It's like, this is very much like, uh, well, when I write it down, it's like, it's, this record's, as much as it's an industrial record, and uh, it's really like a blend of new wave and rock, more so than anything else that you would ever find in industrial. At least on this album, yeah, it goes it goes a lot harder, and then it be kind of goes far more into alternative for a little while. And then he goes, then he did, then he had probably the most industrial album since uh, what Dower Spiral with Year Zero. But it's like this is a guy who. People, it's like, Nine Tails has always been an industrial act, but it's one of those groups where it's like Metallica and stuff like that, where he got big, so he sold out, so he's not industrial. You know, that sort of, right. uh, that sort of thing. But it's, but the thing is, there are people who do electronic based stuff like him, like, say, Marilyn Manson or Rob Zombie, where it's like, Manson is more of a metal band that uses electronic elements. Rob Zombie's solo stuff is a little bit more industrial than, say, White Zombie was. Right, yeah, yeah. Although, you know, the, the last uh, Astro Creep is definitely an industrial album. But, you know, it's like you start going down this rabbit hole of, you know, would Power Man 5000 be this? Because Nine Inch Nails definitely is. But, uh, God, this is one of those albums that... It's insane that the head of TBT thought this album was shit. <laughs> and he was just going to kill Rezzer's career. But because it, you know, it, it hit and it hit big, it actually allowed him to go seek out Interscope Records and start and he just started recording the Wish EP in secret. And, you know, basically it, it allowed him to get out of out of the out of TVT space and into uh, a place where he was allowed to grow, you know, grow musically and and the thing is, I'm always referring to Nine Inch Nails as Tread Reznor because kind of like KMFDM in a way, he is the band, right? And everyone else is a guest on it, right? Because what's his face? Patrick went on to do. Did he leave after this album to go create Filter? No, I think he was. I think it was on Wish. At le- he was at least on Wish. Maybe he was on uh, Downward. But yeah, you had you had him. You had uh, you know Charlie Charlie Closer. Uh, you have Atticus Ross is now in the band. Is probably the only what uh, if you're gonna say anyone is Nine Inch Nails with Trent Reznor right now. It's Atticus Ross. You know what's terrible is I feel like such a fucking poser whenever I hear you talk about music because you know all the people. And I'm like, well, if they're not an A-list band, I don't know the most. Of that. Even then, I barely know. Well, even then, I there's a lot of people who've been in Nine Inch Nails, and I can't remember them all. I just think the, the silliest, you know, the silly craziest thing is uh, what stuff that Trent Reznor did be, before and alongside this. Because he did a song for uh, he was uh, one of the members of a band called Pig Face, uh, which is like an industrial collective, uh-huh. and and the song that the song that he did with that also ended up on the Wish EP. Did I ever Stuff. tell you? 
I worked at a hotel and there was the night guy. And I'm telling you right now, nearly every single last person who works overnight at a hotel is, uh, is probably fried mentally from being up all night. And this guy would stay uh, up all night working on his computer trying to recreate his version of Nine Inch Nails music. And because Trent Reznor was his favorite artist, and I would listen to it, and I was like, "Yeah, I think you're missing what works in Nine Inch Nails," but I didn't want to tell him that. And, I, and then one day he's like, "I'm gonna be famous. I'm gonna release an album. I quit." And I was like, "Just go, please, just go." <laughs> and then that guy became. Uh, shit, I'm trying to think about industrial band. Yeah. <laughs> that guy became. Hey, do you want large or medium or super size? <laughs> That guy was Kirtsov from Bile. There you go. Well, I don't, I, that's such a fucking deep cut. I don't even know what the hell that means. But go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I needed someone. I, I needed someone okay. to quickly think of a name. <laughs> but, yeah, it's he did that uh, with, with Al Drake. Instead of that, he did uh, – he was on uh, 1,000 Homo DJs, uh, <sighs> like, only only re- couple of release, which has, has probably one – the only good song is they did a cover of Supernaut. And apparently there, there is a version that does have Trent Reznor's vocals. Uh-huh. And then one that is allegedly Al Jurgensen's vocals. Although Al says that all he did was just he treated uh, Trent's vocals so that you couldn't tell. Oh, okay. But it is a very, uh, it's a hell of a cover though. Did it take a while for this album to hit? Because when I saw that it was 1989, I was thrown off because I thought this was 91. Yeah, it well, it was a bit of a slow burn because it didn't get promoted. It was just kind of everyone just it got word released of mouth. and word of mouth kind of brought it, and all of a sudden people were just going, "Whoa, what is this?" But of course, you know, like I said, this is the without this amazing stepping stone. Although let's let's all admit to ourselves, Sin, the only good version of Sin is actually the live version. Sin's not a bad song, but. You listen to that live version off off that live album that it, that they released, and it is ten thousand times better than this album cut. Okay. But uh, you know, tr- imagine this world. Trent Reznor doesn't get this album out. Wish doesn't happen, and then we don't get Wish winning being the only Grammy winning song with the lyrics "fist fuck." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what kind of world would we be living in if was... that didn't happen? <laughs> Worse than this one, really? <laughs> All right, uh, is it my turn? Dark room. It is your turn. Okay, so we're starting to get to the better stuff, but I still got one more. Like, ah, eh, fine, I'll throw it on the list. Uh, Cult, Sonic Temple. I just turned like I was from New Orleans. Then my accent just went weird there. Let me try again. Cult, Sonic Temple. <laughs> um. I do not think it's as good as the last album by any means, um, because I feel like they were going for their own sound, but mixed in with some of the Doors metal. That's what its biggest weakness. Well, it's, that's the thing. As much as I give Bob Rock shit for being the guy who quote unquote ruined Metallica, um, yeah, he did a good job with this album. It's like, yeah, it, you're right. It's less, it's less on the far less gothy. It's far less. Uh, Rock, you know, Rick Rubin definitely brought in his own his own style on electric. This one, and like I said, Bob Rock, who worked, you know, worked with like Bon Jovi and Motley Crue and stuff like that. He is there for radio sounds, and mm-hmm. in a way, I think this is probably the album that sounds the most complete. Where it's like, I don't not don't necessarily think that it's better than electric or or love both of those albums you know have a uh, special place in my heart but i do think that that including sonic temple it is a trifecta of really good albums that they have and it probably they're the best of the cult are these three albums yeah wait wait, wait wait they had more than three albums i thought they broke up after this album am i wrong you're wrong. They have a whole bunch of albums. Oh shit! I guess they, we just stopped hearing about them. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They they kind of faded away. They, I, God, what? There's like at least two, two or three more albums. Then there was a there was a pretty long hiatus, and then they came back like uh, in the 2000 in like the 2010s. Oh okay. Because they have 
they had one album that I think came out in 2012, and I think the other was like in 2016 or 17. Yeah, there's not so, much to say about this one, so I'm going to go ahead and just move along. Yeah, well, Edie and uh, Firewoman, of oh, course, is the big Firewoman one. Firewoman yeah. are, are the are the two are the two hits, and they're goddamn right they're the hits. They're yeah. Great. <laughs> but all right, for me, let's finish. Let's finish. Well, actually, no, I don't have to finish my industrial thing because I got a little bit more to do. But Ministry, a mind is a terrible thing to taste. I'm stepping out of this one. I bailed after oh. like three songs. I just couldn't get through it. Oh man, because this has uh, like, God. So what is amazing? Thieves, which is one of, like the first tracks on there, which is one of their bigger songs. Burning inside, breathe. Like, heck, it had it. It has a rap song on it. A track called uh, "Test." It features this uh, New York rapper named K Light. But effectively, this was kind of the culmination of that ministry style evolution because you had the first album that we listened to which was that uh, total new wave thing then it kind of went to like a uh, industrial dancey type thing a little harsher but still a little mellow then the first album that they did uh, land of uh, rape and honey which end up having a lot of metal influence then you hit this one and it's now all it's now what we know ministry to be. It's the heavy guitars. It's the high, high speak uh, drum beats. It's everything. But like, really, this album is a product of Al Jurgensen's heavy drug use yeah. and a lot of and a lot of discord. Uh, so basically, no one in the band really collaborated. They just kind of wrote stuff and then you know went. Oh, okay, that's what you did. All right, well let's let's try this with that, and they Oops. kind of built this album out of chaos, and it's it sounded like chaos to me, and I think that's yeah, why I it's, quit. Yeah, it's not, not their. It isn't their best album, actually. That would be the that would be the following album, but it's about where they. It's getting to the point where they do kind of plateau for a little while, and then it's. I'll be honest, a little bit of I love Ministry, but mixed results from from uh, Psalm sixty nine after after that album. But that would be it. All right, so my next selection is Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever, and looking up his uh, discography last night, I didn't realize that he. I don't understand the point. He would make all those albums with the Heartbreakers, but then every once in a blue moon, he would go off on his own making songs that basically sounded just like the ones he made with the Heartbreakers. So what was the fucking point? So this one is, I think, his first solo album. He did three of them. And uh, it's, I think it's his biggest album. And these songs are massive. I, was, I remember the videos were everywhere, and the songs just wouldn't leave the radio, and I never get sick of them. But um, the one that no one ever talks about from this is Running Down a Dream, and I think that is the best single on this by far. Oh, I, I'm surprised you're saying that, because I would have said... You know that that's one of the songs I I know like the best of being the as a single. Maybe it's I because mean, it's, at work we play Tom Petty all the time, but we never play this one. And this one just has a really great intro. That that guitar riff is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing is what's amazing about this album is the a just if you're just looking at it as a record, the a side of this album is better than most full you know full length LPs. Yeah, hands down. Like, and this is a hell of an album. The you know side B is still great, but side A is just you know there's nothing bad on it. Every song would improve any album that it's on. It, you had you had uh, put put Never Back Down on that Elvis Costello album, and I'd be 100 percent far more interested in listening to the rest of that. Elvis yeah, yeah. Costello the the juxtaposition between the two albums is uh, not <laughs> is not insignificant. Yeah. But but it's I think it, and ironically this the full moon fever does feature some of the members of the heartbreakers yeah well, also yeah. members of uh, traveling Wilburys so it's it's like a oh, yeah. amalgamation of everything that he's done for the last decade in this album yeah it's I don't want to say this is the last great Tom Petty 
think is he's done he did some great work after it but I don't think after this he ever hit anything higher than this album now like, are you talking album, on his own or with the oh, Heartbreakers even, even, even with the Heartbreakers like I mean there's some amazing stuff with the Heartbreakers I think this is probably like the absolute perfection out like anything he did after this A gets compared to this but yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's that yeah it's that thing where it's like you write a masterpiece how do you follow up on that which album is it that had Last Dance with Mary Jane I thought it was the next one but I don't even see that no that I think it was just a single oh so it's not associated with an album okay I remember that one was yeah. uh, everywhere for a long time that's a really good one I can still sing every lyric of that one yeah I think I believe that one just like showed up on like a greatest hits collection oh okay. that would make sense yes yeah I could be wrong I'm pretty sure because I think I was I did that too like when I first started listening to Petty I think I was looking for that album and I'm like where the hell is that one I'm looking it up right now let's dance American. go ahead and what's your next album while I look this up alright well my next album is going to be Pop Will Eat Itself this is the day this is the hour this is this yeah you we were just talking about the fact that uh, you know hip hop was going into heavy samples, and then we have uh, industrial, but now electronica. We, we're, we're coming into the age of like Jesus Jones and EMF over the next couple of years, and I feel like these guys were the first. Yeah, like Popula itself was never a huge band, even at their biggest. No one, it's like no one really knew who these people were, or still do, because they still kind of pop in and out every now and then but they are the people that gave uh, film composer Clint Mansell you know he does uh, the vocals on this album and you know I mean, Clint Mansell if you don't know who that is he's the guy who's composed most of uh, Darren Aronofsky's films oh okay okay and he did like half of Duncan Jones's things uh, he did the sound, uh, soundtrack to uh, Smoke and Aces he did for DC on um, for like the DC and HBO Plus shows uh, Titans and Doom Patrol, but it's like this album was produced by Flood, who's done work with like Smashing Pumpkins, New Order, Depeche Mode, Nick Cave, and basically this band was a, a Grebo band, which was a genre of music that basically kind of blended punk, hip hop, psychedelia, and electric dance music. And you can hear a lot of the hip hop influences in things like uh, Inject Me, uh, Wise Up Suckers. Definitely Wise Up Suckers. Yeah, That's yeah. Funny. But there's dance songs like Can You Dig It? Uh, there's a, effectively a pop song, which was DEF CON 1. But it's like, it's. It's this, uh, like, there was one song, uh, Wake Up, Time to Die, which had this uh is that from Blade Runner? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh it used that sample and it kinda reminded me of David Essex's uh rock on at moments where I'm just like suddenly going, This sounds familiar and I had to go and actually look you know, had to go and actually look up look up the song and be like, Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I hear it <laughs> But it's of of everything that Pop will eat itself did this is maybe the maybe the best you know they they had a couple of other pretty good albums but this is probably the like if you're gonna check them out this is the thing to do because it's probably the most unique of uh, especially of anything released this year yeah so what do you got um just want to let you know that is from his greatest hits album so it was just to help boost that one and it was completely separate it was recorded for wildflowers but they decided to put on the Greatest Hits collection first. Um, my next one is Faith No More, The Real Thing. Ah, this feel, like, I've, I, we, we talked about Faith No More a bit and, like, how I never, as far as I can tell, maybe this, I had heard this album in its entirety, and I still am not entirely certain if I have until doing this, but yeah. uh, it feels like the logical growth from what Red Hot Chili Peppers was doing. Right, yeah. And, and then the fact that we were just talking about the, the mixture of sounds. It's just, it's all culminating in 1989. 
Yeah, and which, which is also kind of funny because that was the controversy about this album. Basically, the the idea that Mike Patton was just biting Anthony Kiedis's style, which is really silly because, you know, yes, there's a little bit of similarity in what uh, what Mike Patton's doing, especially in like say, uh, uh, oh god, epic. Uh, this album is far more metal than it is like funk. Yeah, well, and of course, every album is different. Yeah, on that. Definitely oh, I'm sorry. Too. I'm sorry. I lost track of what you're you're saying compared to Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's like this one is a much more metally album that has some funk has some funk feel to it. Yeah. And that's it. Just yeah. This was this was fun. I uh, I traded baseball cards for this cassette, and I listened to it all the time, and it was a good because baseball cards are worthless. This album is not. Don't tell me that. I've got baseball cards that I need to try and sell. Fool, you damn fool. It still shocks me that people call every day and ask, hey, what kind of baseball or sports cards do you have in? I'm like, why do you give a fuck? Sports cards were around when we didn't have very many video games and we could watch whatever movie we wanted to. <laughs> I don't understand what the fucking point of a, car, a baseball... Why? Do it. Why? Sounds like old guys like in their 50s just trying to, I'm going to make a profit someday. I'll be rich. Yeah, no. I, I I just knew that my comic cards were going to be worth something in the future. Actually, they are. They're starting to take off now. They, it was a whole thing this last year. They're starting to take off. People are starting to slab them and get them graded. Yeah, no, I, mine are definitely not... Uh... No, you better slab them. They're, they're 5.0. <laughs> you better pay for it. Uh, from Out of Nowhere, of course, is one of the best kickoff songs I've ever heard. Uh, and then it just goes from there. Epic, Falling to Pieces. Falling to Pieces, I think is actually better than Epic, which was their big hits. Some people are calling one hit wonders and that makes my skin fucking curl up and want to attack because well, no. there I'm were three sorry. hit wonders. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I was going to say cuz the next album had a couple of hits off it too and I'm just confused. Um and what is it? What's the one their last single uh before they broke up um uh, Last Cup of Sorrow? I remember that was a hit. So these people don't know what the fuck they're talking about unless they're talking on top 40 or something. Yeah, it's like I will the only song that people remember, let, okay. let's be honest, is All right. epic. Yeah, is yeah, epic. Yeah, yeah, doesn't mean doesn't mean midlife crisis isn't a isn't a jam or or a, why can't I think of the song from the last album and the first out al- and the very first album? We, the, oh, the, the, uh, the, we the, care a lot and we um, care a lot. There you go. What was the other one that was a hit off that? I can't remember. Introduce yourself, but I don't think that was a single. But yeah, definitely uh, we care a lot. If if you you know they were a one hit wonder, they had it like I said minimum three hits, and you've and you've at least said four. Yeah, it all depends on the radio station, I guess, is what you're talking about because it says here that it, tr- it hit number nine on uh, the top forty. So I guess that's what they're saying. Uh, looking at this, I didn't realize the this is where they got the war pigs from. It was from the bonus. Uh, tracks off of the non-vinyl. I don't remember that being on my cassette, so it must have been on the CD. Yeah, I, the, anytime I'd, I'd seen this album, like a track listing, it's always had War Pigs, and that had always been post-CD release. Okay, yeah, that's always on their greatest hits. Uh, it's just, it's a really fun ride, and it has a lot on its mind, but not necessarily, like, political. You can have a deep album, and it doesn't have to be about love or politics or social issues, there, I feel like I'm watching just a collection of B movies that are stuffed into Mike Patton's brain, and he's just <laughs> unleashing it. Oh man, yeah, this this is fun. And if we do the next one, I definitely oh, I absolutely have to. to. That's my favorite okay. one. Okay, then I will definitely enjoy hearing Angel Dust in in its entirety. Yes. All right. What is your next one? All right, my next one is the Batman soundtrack by Prince. <laughs> so much fun revisiting so, this. So much fun. So, Do you remember how big this was? Yes. Oh, okay, this is the thing. It took the entire 80s for us to actually do a Prince album. What the fuck is wrong with us? I don't like, know. Well, well, well no, remember it, in the beginning when we had only five choices? That was the problem. We, we would get rid of the ones that everybody already knew, and that's why we didn't do them. Because yeah, we're it, trying to pick the stuff that's more under the radar, but when we expanded to 10 is when we started to struggle and I started stuffing in stuff that was well-known. 
Yeah, and and that's the thing. It's like most of my, you know, it's like most of my picks are so underground. You need a helmet and a canary. Yeah. <laughs> and and Prince, let's be honest, is one of the biggest, most important musical artists of all time. You know, if if we had just started out going, let's do popular shit. I mean, hell, we would have to have done maybe Purple Rain. Right, you know? but it was only like what two years ago we started adding the more just to fill out ten that we started adding more popular stuff. Yeah. And that's the thing. Is this was a massive soundtrack. This this was originally conceived to be a duet album between Prince and Michael Jackson. Really? Where Prince was supposed to do like kind of the pop type songs for the heroes. Where, uh, where yeah, Michael Jackson was doing pop songs, and then Prince was doing like funk tracks for the villains. Uh huh. And this did, does kind of did kind of still happen a little bit uh, conceptually because. The tracks are kind of uh, credited to the heroes and villains who are quote unquote singing them. You know what's funny is I don't remember a lot of the softer songs. I don't remember them in the movie. I even had this album. I don't remember it. But you tell me the, the stuff that was heavily played in the movie, like Trust, Party Man, and uh, a Bat Dance, which actually I don't. Is that even in the movie? I don't think that's in that, the movie. That's, a, that's on the credits, if I remember. Oh, okay. Right. And it's just, I remember having so much fun listening to this, but then stopping and going, I don't remember this song at all. I must have fast forwarded past it or something. Yeah, it, and that's the thing. Like, there's, there's like romance songs. There's all, there's all kinds of stuff in here. But yeah, let, let's be honest. Like, it's Party Man and uh, Trust, which are just like, I mean, as as amazing as this album is. Those two songs in particular are just fire. Yeah, just, and, they, and if you were to put together a top ten list of Prince songs, they have to be in there for me. Oh, definitely, definitely. But pretty much, yeah. I at this point, Prince has, you know, somewhat started to start, you know, for flying under the radar. Where, you know, I mean, uh, not not just the fact that he died, but. Uh, he kind of he made tons and tons of music that he never released so he had albums that he released but he never like got got promoted as much as he would have hell he there's a new prince album out right now i saw yeah yeah i was surprised yeah uh, well same thing for tom petty there's a whole new single that just came out yeah it's like i have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of a lot of those uh archive things that are going to start getting rolled out little by little yeah. at this point. But, uh, you know, if anyone's going to try, you know, try some prints, uh, well, yeah, listen to the Purple Rain album. But, yeah, uh, then maybe you know, listen to that was 89. <laughs> you know, this was a, a huge thing and a huge deal and definitely worth listening to. So, you're next. Uh, B-52's Cosmic Thing. The big, huge, maybe their biggest album ever. It was such a massive comeback after the loss of uh, their guitarist. And so they took four years off and come back. And I thought their last album was a little weak and did just roar. And the whole world remembered who they were or discovered for the first time. And I think a lot of it has to do with their uh, producers, Nile Rodgers and Don Waz. Um who were really known for making pop hits. I mean, to this day, everybody knows Love Shack. Sadly, not as much as Rome, which I think is a really great song, or Channel Z, but that Love Shack, everybody knows that song. Oh, yeah. Love Shack is... I guess, yeah, Love Shack would be the hit. I, I do think it's a little weird that Channel Z was the first to single from this album. Uh-huh. It... Like, that's very specific. Honestly, that was a real channel in Los Angeles. Well, and also, it's very much like I don't, I don't say it's like the weirdest or you know off you know most off kilter thing that's on the album necessarily, but uh, it's weird. And even for B fifty twos, it's kind of like that's a weird thing. Whereas Love Shack is very much like a he, you know little head bobber toe tapper thing that you just kind of can enjoy so much yeah whereas at the same time rome really as it's my favorite song on the album 100 percent, feels a little bit as an outlier because it's 
so conventional, I guess. Although yeah. it, do, it does have the little psychedelic, you know, kind of psychedelic feel to it, but uh, it feels a little bit more like, oh, here's a conventional pop song. Whereas, uh, you know, like Topaz, Deadbeat Club, you know, it's like some of these songs that are a little more more feel like a B-52 song. Yeah. Well, Rome, <clears throat> excuse me, Rome uh, has a universal theme. And I think that's what connects emotionally for me better than Love Shack. Love Shack's just a wild, crazy party song. But Rome, I get that, that wandering heart. <clears throat> excuse me. It's, it is a beautiful song. And again, that's, I, like I said, it does have a universal appeal to it. And it's, it, it, it's not hurt by the fact that again that it's well you know it's well performed all the music's great you know everything about it is so 100% solid because you can have a a song about a universal topic that is complete and total garbage although ironically you could also have it be the only good song a band has ever released like <clears throat> rearranged by Limp Bizkit <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Even the songs that I like, even the songs that I enjoy by that shitty band. What the fuck is going on with this band? I don't understand the wig, and I don't understand why people are embracing them again. They fucking blow. They've always fucking blown. Yeah, well, and I will give this to any group, any anything, any music at all. Everyone is entitled to at least one, you know, good album, and they blew theirs on their second album. Oh. They literally only have one good album, and they shot it, and they did that. They took that shot way too early in their career to actually have something that is listenable. But again, they basically only have really one song that is genuinely good, and that's it. And what is that? I don't even know. What is that? Oh, Rearranged. That's their only good good song. Sorry. I thought, okay, go ahead. Your right. turn. Anyway, we're back to, oh, yeah, we're back to B-52s. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. For me, let's get back to my list. And we are going to say, how about Ice Tease, The Iceberg, Freedom of Speech? Okay. Just watch what you say. I, at first, was confused as to why you chose this. And I listened to the first two songs, and I was like, this is pretty standard stuff. I don't know what so, you know, would make this your list. And all of a sudden, like, on the third track, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, it gets better. And then he has the heavy metal track. And then he has my favorite track on, I can't remember it now, but it's the one with the, like, the syndicate, I think it was, where it's a bunch of them together working in harmony, bouncing around with different tones. I love that style of hip-hop. What, what, what the hell is that one called? Let's see, that I'll one... Look. Yeah, I think, what is it, uh... Talk about. Oh God, it's more they like say different... party like every ten seconds, but it works. Well, I want to say that might have been. Uh... Oh God, uh, this oh, hit the deck maybe. I'll look it up. You go ahead and talk about it. I'll look yeah, it up. but yeah, basically this this was an album that was uh, in response to all the censorship issues he was having on tour. Basically, you saw how easy it was for the for state and federal governments. To enforce their will over things, you know, things they felt were profane or dangerous. So basically, just wrote an entire album. Uh, first, it kind of has like, you know, sure songs that have his outlandish sexual escapades, you know, Iceberg or uh, The Girl Tried to Kill Me, which uh, that's the one you're talking about, the metal one, because that has Ernie C, who uh, ended up becoming the guitarist for Body Count. Oh, okay. Yeah, the. Like the consequences of violence with songs like Peel the, Their Caps Back, uh, The Hunted Child. You know, songs about how ego and hubris will ruin you. Like uh, with uh, You Played Yourself. Uh, Hit the Deck and This One's For Me uh, are like advice to upcoming MCs. Especially This One's For Me is basically about his view of, of the music industry, especially kind of how uh, he's like, kind of how public enemy is not exactly what he would be wanting to do because he kind of felt that they were a little uh not necessarily extreme but not posers either just i thought were... that he was standing up for public enemy in that song it's not like he was like trying to watch out for them like i, I, I think there was some there was some beef between them but uh he's like you got 
but there's like a social and political commentary with like lethal weapon uh, which is basically about how the mind is actually the most powerful weapon and of course the one I think is maybe not maybe the best album uh, track on the album which is freedom of speech which is how limited your freedom of speech can be because of people like the PMRC yeah I thought, see, when I heard the iceberg, I was like, this is some low-rent garbage right here. I did not understand it at all. It was just like, yo, my dick's so big, and I'm fucking this girl. And I was like, what the hell? Um, but uh, then it corrects its chorus real quick. But uh, the track that I really liked with the, all the other rappers oh, was What You Wanna Do. What You Wanna Do. Yeah, what that you was wanna really do. good. I had it on here as, like, the very last thing. Like, And it has a fun party song. <laughs> By the do? way, I thought that you were... When you said the iceberg freedom of speech, just watch what you say, my phone only showed the iceberg slash freedom of speech. When you said just watch what you say, I was like, God damn, John's protective of iced tea. What the fuck? All right, I won't say anything bad about iced tea. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't think I've sold you on iced tea yet. Not yet. But, but it's... This, uh, again... Uh, the, the, not the previous album, the previous album was Power, but the one right before that uh, is his debut. It's like he's kind of growing a bit as an artist and as as a rapper, and he's you're starting to see a lot of you know his the maturing in some cases. I mean, granted, yes, they're still just sex songs, but yeah. uh, well, this but this idea of you know I do as much as I have you know. I still want to be a boisterous, uh, braggadocious person. There is actual shit for me to say, too. Right. It doesn't say much from me that my favorite thing that Ice-T has ever done was Tink Girl. <laughs> I love him in that role. <laughs> uh. well, well, what is your next one? Uh, Chris Isaac, Heart-Shaped World. I can't believe we're like only three quarters of the way through this list. What the fuck? <laughs> 20, 20 albums wow. is a bit... <laughs> Uh, this is his big breakthrough album. I, I think it's a little bit weaker than the other ones because now he's trying to go for a more R&B uh, mainstream sound instead of the more rockabilly, which I love, on his last two albums and his very first two albums. But the, the, he's still an amazing singer, and his construction of song is so unique to this time period. Nobody else is really making music like this, especially on a major label. And, of course, everybody knows uh, Wicked Game because that's the one where everybody like gets horny over people getting like lusty on a beach. Um, and it's still an all timer. We played at work, which is weird because I work for a conservative store. But I'm like, this song's about getting it on. <laughs> I want to. I'm waiting for the play. Baby did a bad bad thing. <laughs> well, let, let's be honest. Like a good 60, 70 percent of rock music in from any given era is about having sex. True. We played My Sharona, and that thought that song's fucking creepy. But yeah, it, this is one I thought it was good but definitely not as good as as the previous ones that yeah. i've heard it's i kind of like yeah it, I, I started hearing like this country feel to it kind of early on i'm like okay that's that's what he's doing with this one like again less rockability less rock kind of a little more it kind of it did kind of feel like he was chasing a little bit more of Let's just kind of do something that's a little more radio. -ish. Yeah, well, he got a lot of pressure from the the label. The, the The first two albums got good critical acclaim. It had a small cult following, but it just wasn't selling. So, I mean, I read into this, and they said they wanted him to push for a more modern sound. So, if the next couple albums of his are like this, and that's when I get kind of bored. Yeah, it, I I don't know. It, like the Wicked Game is definitely the the hit of the album, and anything else I couldn't. I could probably hear his background music, but yeah. I definitely wouldn't be wouldn't be seeking it out. I feel like this didn't hit in '89. I feel like it hit in 1990. Wasn't Wicked Game part of the Wild at Heart soundtrack? Am I wrong? I yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, and that's when it hit big. It was that summer in that weird fucking movie? I know you love David. I know everybody on the planet loves David Lynch. I don't get him. Yeah. I'm not gonna go like I'm that much in love. I know, I know. We uh, you recently posted the uh, Twin Peaks thing, so yeah. I think you can hear me be a lot more critical of David Lynch than uh, uh, Andrew or Elby. All right, so it's your turn. All right, next one is 808 State 90. 
Why don't I remember this album? I listened to it and I don't remember it. Crap. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm. Well, I'll get into maybe why you don't remember it. Uh, okay, basically, 808 State takes their name from a type of drum machine called a Roland TR-808. And let, let's add a little bit of context to that. That drum machine has been used on more number one records than any other drum machine. Wow. It was used... It was used uh, it was used on Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing, Africa Bombada's Planet Rock, a couple of couple of songs from uh, one of your albums. Uh, it's on records by Whitney Houston, Run DMC, Public Enemy, LL Cool J, Madonna, Kesha, Phil Collins used this thing. So, these are one of the guys. These are one of the pioneers of a thing called Acid House. Okay. It, oh, now I remember um, the album. Yeah, that, I like this one. It was a kind of a mood setter. Yeah, that, especially what it is, is it's, you know, basically it's like, was, uh, basically As a House is, while techno, which is, while a shorthand for electronic music is a music genre in itself, which is basically, it's, you know, originally it was just kind of like the things that people say, oh yeah, that's what Kraftwerk, New Order, Front 242 did, uh, it's basically music that DJs would make for dance music that utilized like a four-four, four on the floor beat, and you know had a tempo about 120, 150 beat per, beats per minute. Acid House kind of took that, took those ideas, and started exploring texture of sound, as opposed to creating and exploring like melody and stuff. Yeah. So the idea is like you take these simple bass lines. And then you manipulate the frequency and resonance to create a lot more elaborate sounds. And it's kind of hard to talk about because, again, what I said is it's effectively a uh, it's sound experiment. It's it's music like that. It's like you know, basically, it's like it's the instrumentals for Depeche Mode or New Order songs. It's not like techno music and electronic music that's like this it's about creating that environment it's definitely not like uh it's not as abstract as like psyche tv or even the cocteau twin stuff but it's an experience and you can't you know no one can be told what the matrix is you have to see it for yourself <laughs> and yeah this is this is the sort of stuff where it's just it's cool and what's nice about 808 State in particular, it's pretty good chill music. It's there just kind of like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, later on techno that's very aggressive and dancey or uh, effectively the sound of throwing a, a box of, uh, of ball bearings on the ground and making that into music. Uh, <laughs> so like early stomp. It, it's, you know, it, it's things like that where it's like you know people will do interesting things this one was a little bit more of just kind of you know what here's some kind of dancey music there's some stuff that's upbeat you could enjoy it but it's pretty much there for just you know i'm anyway it's here for list albums in particular anyway is there for relaxing and so i i stand by anyone who wants to check this out and for just chilling out okay so what is your next one? My next one is Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique. And yes, this does have, uh, on Paul Revere, does use the 808. <laughs> Paul Revere's not on this one. Was it? No, oh, he's shit. on the previous That's... album. And I, I have never made it quiet that I really don't like their previous album. I think it's frat boy, obnoxious bullshit that I had to hear non-fucking-stop. Yes, I own the album. Yes, I listened to it, but... I'm, we're, still, we're talking like a decade out, and all I could hear still is blasting out of people's cars. But Paul's Boutique is the one that got ignored, even though it was critically acclaimed, and the label was confused by what to do with it, so they kind of casually threw it out there. I think they only had one hit single off this, and that was uh, Rump Shaker. Or all Hey, ladies. No, it was Hey, ladies. Yeah, um, tr yeah Shaker Rump, uh, Looking Down the Barrel of a Gun, those are also, I think, pretty pretty song strong tracks yeah they're great but i don't remember them being a hit single i remember the video for rump shaker and it being too weird for everybody 
but uh, I don't remember uh, looking down the barrel of a gun and being a single, but I could be wrong. I was also 12 at the time, so, and I did not hear this when it came out. I didn't hear it till like, 94, I want to say. Yeah, it's like, I, I didn't hear this till like, the, like, the late 90s. I, I've always had a problem with this album, and yeah. it's like, I, in a general sense, I don't particularly like it, but I think it's because it's sonically overproduced. It, it, it's well, it's just trying to do something. Like I said, EPMD kind of got to it first a year <laughs> earlier, but um, Beastie Boys were trying to create something completely brand new to separate themselves somewhat from their previous album, especially since they were so angry with Russell Simmons by taking all their money. Um, well, but, it's like the, the the people who did this album, who did like the the beat layers and all that stuff. Yeah, the, the Dust, Dust Brothers, Brothers, right? Yeah, and. They love sampling. Yes, there's they, so much of it. I, I actually yeah. love it because I'm a movie freak and I love trying to figure out what all the samples are from. Yeah. And, and plus, I hear half those songs at work. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, and they, they create these elaborate soundscapes. And I think my, I think my problem with this album is, is that they don't know when enough is enough. So it's like they, they've created this, like, this Frankenstein of a beat yeah. out of all these things. It's and the, it's the pet it's, sounds of hip hop. It really is because yeah. pet sounds itself can be overwhelming. Yeah, and then it's like they they create this this thing, and then they add like ten more layers onto that onto that cake. I, know, I love it, but that's just me. Yeah, it's like Car Thief, for instance. The beat is really interesting, but then there's moments in where the music is just far too much for the vocals themselves, and just kind of starts to distract it. And like Rick Rubin. You know, had was much simpler and kept kind of kept the backing music simple. You know, in a fairly simplistic, because he knew that we were here for the for the Beastie Boys. We were here for that, not necessarily the instrumentals. And I think the Dust Brother just kind of went, well, yeah, and I'm sh-, you know, along with Beastie Boys themselves, it's <clears throat> let's go and as you said, do something different. And I would actually love just an instrumental only version of this album that would be interesting yeah i would love to hear this just just you know naked i just want to hear just hear the beats just hear just hear the soundscape because i i'm more interested in that than their raps when these two things are combined whereas the yeah the songs you know eh, some songs are good some songs I could live without, <laughs> but uh, I think this either strip down the strip down the the layers a little bit and maybe try like try it again, see if there's a way to keep the integrity of the songs but not make it so chaotic. Yeah, can you imagine or, how expensive this album would be today with all the samples? It would be impossible. Um, yeah, yeah. It, like I said, that, I just like I said, I would love to hear just just the beats of these these things that that impresses me more than what what the Beastie Boys are actually yeah. and, doing. And I it think just... that they would focus more on their next album. And I, I still think that uh, Hello Nasty is their best album, but this is my second favorite. Yeah, I could I could go with that. I can go with that. All right, your turn. We're at an hour already. Good lord. All right. Well, I'll. This is the last one I have a lot to say in the other two. I don't have much. So, okay. Extreme. Extreme. The, uh, this is... I picked this out mainly because of the closing track, Play With Me. And it's not because it was in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's a... Really, this is a band that got famous for one song, uh, More Than Words, off their second album. But Extreme has the best-kept secret out there. And it's guitarist Nuno Betancourt. Yeah. No one ever talks about him. I just yelled into the microphone. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> he is, yeah, he is probably one of the most, you know, amazing guitarists living today. And go on YouTube, look up uh, Nuno Betancourt, look up, like, just his solos. He is amazing. Extreme, for the most part, this album is just kind of eh. You kind of, like, you get a couple songs in, and it takes you, like, Mother, don't want to go to school today. All of a sudden, it's like Eddie Van Halen just walked into the recording studio and just started playing. <sighs> and that's Nuno. 
and it fucking shreds. And, you know, it's like, you, you get a couple more good songs, and you get to play with me. And that that song blows everything out of the water. It is amazing. And it's... He... I, I don't... I don't understand why Extreme isn't bigger, or why Nuno didn't just... You know, he had so much loyalty to to this band that he's stuck around for as long as he has because he could be anywhere. He could be doing anything. You know, and he could be in Van. Halen. He could he could have replaced Eddie Van Halen, and no one would have batted an eye. Yeah, <laughs> wrong person to replace. <laughs> I still have never listened to that Van Halen three. <sighs> no, it's not a good album. Even even by even. I'm not a I'm not a Van Hagar fan, but it's even worse than Van Hagar. Ooh, you're gonna suffer in 1991. <laughs> <laughs> For unlawful carnal knowledge. Yes, huh? it's it's the only album from theirs that I really liked. Yeah. Hey. Well, it's got, it's yeah. got right now. It's yeah, good. we'll wait. But anyway, what's your what's your next one? Uh, Young MC, Stone Cold Ryman. I owned this tape as a kid too, and I didn't notice until just now. Uh, it was also produced by the Dust Brothers. They must have moved straight from Paul's Boutique right into this. But this is more coherent. Well, they, they think they produced, like, a song on it. Oh. Because it's, it's produced by... I forget who it is. I, I looked, Quincy I Jones. It says and, Quincy Jones and Dust Brothers. Yeah, I think Quincy Jones and... God, because I, I was looking up on Wikipedia and they had a couple of things. But I know that uh, that most of the songs were... We're not them, and we're not the Dust Brothers. Because again, it's. I wish I could find which song it was. I think wish I wrote it down because apparently I didn't. But anyway, I only know "Bust a Move" off this album. It's it is a fire. You know that that song is amazing. Yeah. And it's kind of a war crime that that song is now obscure. Yeah, I mean, except for the fact it got a brief revival in that one movie, uh, Up in the Air. That's a it's a, a piece of that movie. But yeah, in general, it's been completely forgotten. No one ever brings it up. I still know it almost completely by heart. Um, I didn't know that Flea did the bass on this until just now. Oh, I did not. I don't think I noticed that either. Yeah, I looked it up and Flea did the okay. bass tracks for uh, two and three. So uh, the first three, I think, are really in so- uh, our first four uh, tracks are really really solid. Uh, I don't really remember much after that, but I remember listening to this all the time and just really loving it. It, it was uh, very nostalgic for me to revisit it. Yeah. Like, I will, I'll say this. Uh, Fastest Rhyme is fun, but wait till we get to uh, the mid-90s and we and I, and I give you some Bone Thugs and Harmony. I've never even listened. I, I remember the track, the singles, but I, I've never listened to Bone Thugs, so I, am, I guess oh. we'll hit that in the 90s. It's going to yeah, be interesting for us because you remember how we mentioned like in 1985, I was like, we have no albums here by anybody who isn't white, and we felt really bad about it. But now we're starting to hit the glory days of hip-hop before gangster rap's really going to take off. I'm not big on gangster rap, but I do love hip-hop. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun discovering like through the 90s how our taste is going to change from where we started. Yeah, because it's... It there's so much stuff like as as great as there are some in the '90s. My God, uh, great there in the '80s. The '90s is really where there's a huge musical yeah, kind of cobia. Yeah, for me, yeah. like '90 90 to '93, and then like '97 on. Oh God, it's glorious. But there's yeah. there's a lull there in the middle where it's just too much gangster, like Snoop Dogg kind of West Coast style. I don't care for. Yeah. Now I'll say this: this album is okay. Like. Pardon me, goes Young MC should have been able to uh, retire on Bust a Move, just period. Like, like that—that's the only song he should have ever needed to have written. And in that, overall, though, I do think the album is okay, but it's just very safe. Yeah, like, well, I mean, this is when hip hop's trying to get to the moms and pops and show that it's not dangerous. And uh... yeah, and it's like it's something my my parents would have been okay with me listening to, and. It's not a complaint, but I do kind of wish it was a little bit more party, maybe. Like, I, I kind of wish it was a, the album wasn't what it was necessarily. Yeah. I can't, like I said, I think it. It fits in the Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff mold. Yeah, I, 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 I wish it was more fun than it is. All and right. That's, 
Yeah. Next. Your turn. My next one is... My name is... <laughs> All right, concrete blonde free. I was actually surprised by this, and I'm I'm a little shocked that no one ever told me about concrete blonde before. I mean, I heard the name, but no one ever told me, and I'm I'm angry with all of you. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. It, free and their next album, Bloodletting, are phenomenal. Yeah. And what's what I think is this is a band that never got the the do that they really should have. Well, I think it's because they didn't have a lockdown sound. They're very expansive in what they wanted to do music, and and I I just think there was something that radio wasn't embracing at the time because it was all still hair metal. Well, then that's the thing. It's like had you shifted these albums, like say this album came out in ninety two or maybe ninety three. Yeah, I can see that. They would have been huge. Like we would we would still have concrete blonde albums going now we would this would be like the one of the biggest bands of the 90s you know the god is a bullet scenes of a perfect crime uh roses grow this track that's basically just percussion and vocals like oh man uh janet uh napol ah, napol ah, why can't i say her last name Napolitano's uh, voice. You made just, that word up. That doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, she's got she's got a last name like mine, where it's just you look at it and then you your brain can't you it just starts to seize up. And I apologize, but yeah, this album I I, I was torn between doing this one and Bloodletting. Bloodletting's a kind of a little more gothicy, but you know I you know free free is. If if I if I need something I'll do I'll do bloodletting again but yes this album's amazing that's all I can say yep okay I think you're on your your last one I'm yes. also, also also on my last legs I got up so early and I'm tired so here we go Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation holy fucking shit why do we not I feel like no one talks about Janet Jackson anymore, but she had like three or four albums in a row that were fucking massive. And and yet I feel like we don't talk about her anymore. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I... Okay, uh, this album's amazing. I do think Control is a lot more of an entertaining album. Yeah, Control was is, better, yeah. But this is much more mature. And it's not because of the social commentary... But it's ly- lyrically and musically, it shows a whole hell of a lot of growth, and there's fire. Yeah, but, and there's con- it's a concept album. Yeah, although it, there's there's these interludes in the songs, and I think, I, I get the idea behind them, but one, there's way too fucking many of them. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, I didn't realize until yeah. just now. Good out lord. The, yeah, out of the first ten tracks, half of those are interludes. <sighs> and also, how can Pledge, the first track, be an interlude? <laughs> it's true. It it... <laughs> uh, yeah, it, Rhythm Nation is such a great song. Uh, Miss You Much is a, a really good one. Um, and I remember Escapade. Oh, Black yeah. Cat, of course, is a fucking badass song. Yeah, the state of the world. Yeah, this. I feel like all these songs are singles. Let me look. Uh, definitely. Rhythm Nation, Escapade, definitely. Uh, Miss You Much, definitely. State of the world, I'm pretty sure was Black Cat. I know was. Uh, okay, so there's only eight tracks on this album, or sorry, ten tracks on this album. The rest are interludes. Eight of them were singles. Eight. <laughs> it is. It is so damn good. Like, wow. yeah, it's. But yeah, this was also like the the, the tour that cost the most money. Wow. Uh, if I remember right, it was like the most expensive tour at at least at the time. I'm sure at this point there are far more expensive tours, but it was like it was obscene, like the millions that were spent on it. But you know what? For for that, it would have been worth it. I think. Yeah, but I remember it exhausted her, and she kind of took some time away. And then when she came back with uh, Janet, which everybody remembers as the "Hey, there's hands on her boobs" uh, album, that one was much more low key. Yeah, I, I remember that like that velvet rope. Uh, I remember those albums. I know I'd seen videos on MTV, but I couldn't tell you anything from. No, that. I couldn't it's, tell you a single album, uh, single from this. Like, it's this is this album in control that I know the most. Yeah, 
Wow, okay, that's the way love goes. That's the only one that I remember. So what what didn't make your list? Okay, uh, wait, did you do all ten? I haven't done all ten yet, but we'll... Okay. Um, so what almost made my list was Tesla, the great radio controversy, um, Op IV Energy, uh, Cindy Lauper, Night to Remember, um, Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood. Those are the ones that I was really hemming and hawing about. Yeah, it's like I was looking at doing Fish's Junta, uh, Pretty Boy Floyd's, Leather Boys with Electric Toys, uh, Meat Beat Manifesto's Storm the Studio, Two Live Crews as Nasty as They Wanna Be, Bad Religion's No Control, and the self-titled debut from Skid Row. Nice. Oh, I should have added that one. I totally forgot it even existed. I would have replaced... I, I know there's not, but I probably would have replaced with that. <laughs> Elvis Costello yeah. Spike, you're off. <laughs> now, now, granted, there was also Tom Petty and... <laughs> yeah, and a few of the ones I stole you from you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but my final album is Nirvana's debut, Bleach. Now... It's, it's like, kind of like if uh, early be- uh, Black Sabbath wrote pop songs. Yeah, I was mm-hmm. actually surprised how uh, catchy this was. Well, it's like, it, especially about a girl is maybe the poppiest uh, thing. Although Swap Meat really does kind of sound like it's an outtake from Nevermind. Uh, I don't think this is a particularly great album, and in. In a way, I do kind of think it's a miracle that anyone heard it and then felt that they could have done Nevermind thereafter. Yeah. Because, uh, let's be honest, it was recorded for pennies. This album has this total live-in-the-studio feel. It's like, uh, it's a noisy kind of, like, Mud Honey meets the Pixies. You know, but messier. You know, but the thing is, it got a lot of good press. But what's funny is I also kind of was looking at some of these reviews, and it kind of seemed very backhanded in a sort of, good for them. Sub Pop signed a band that might be, you know, might actually have some talent, maybe. You know, it it's weird at how this album, I, I really think it had to, it's less this album, I think more of their performance, like their live performances that, showed that this was going to be this this band had this the chops to do this right but again because again it's most like like with never mind it's mostly uh uh Kirk Cobain's t- you know Kirk Cobain doing this music because I think you have you have the uh uh Kurt uh Kurt what's his name uh was I think in in that but they didn't have Dave Grohl yet Dave Grohl doesn't show up until they're going to record Nevermind. So. so they had a completely different drummer, and they even had a secondary guitarist who I think was, if he wasn't the guy who paid for their recording sessions, it was just someone else who was there who also got shit canned pretty quick. <laughs> so it's basically it kind of took, it took two years, partial lineup change, and Butch Vig to basically give us an album that would literally change music forever. But this is... And definitely an interesting step to listen to. Yeah, I, I did not mind it. I, I actually kind of enjoyed it. Yeah, I was. This was one where I fought over because again, Skid Row or Bad Religion. But that is it for me. Yep, and I'm on the ropes, kids. I'm pretty sleepy right now. I apologize. Uh, so check us out on Facebook under Hit Rewind Podcast, and where can we catch you on Twitter? I'm on Twitter at musician, M-Y-U-Z-I-S-H-I-O-N. And that is it, kitties. Uh, we'll be back soon with the a new segment, kind of a spinoff from a show that we used to do together called Comics on Infinite Earths, where we're going to be discussing the comic book events of 1989. And of course, as usual, we will do the video games of 1989, and we'll see you then, or hear you then, or you'll listen to us then. I don't remember how that works. I'm stupid. One of those things. Yeah. All right. Bye. Later, guys.